Today we pick up in Genesis 17 and we see the covenant sign. Now I said at the end of last time that we were together that uh, the sign that God tells Abram uh, to make is a sign of the covenant between him and the Lord is a sign that is adhered to by Jews and Muslims to this day. It is a sign that the New Testament teaches us that Christians do not have are not required to do. We are not saved by keeping this sign. This is not the mark of being a child of God, but this is a mark of being a Jew. This is a mark of being um, a, a descendant of Ishmael. Muslims to this day, uh, the males will practice this sign, this ritual, and um, it is even practiced, I believe, to this day uh, by some Arabs. Uh, you, you can double check me on that, but I believe there's still Arab nations that uh, adhere to this as well because of Ishmael there. Uh, great, 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 however many greats grandfather down the line who also underwent this. So in chapter 17, we're going to pick up in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old. Now remember last time, chapter 16, ended with Abram being 86. So now he's 99. Okay, so that's what, 13-ish years have gone by? When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Now remember, several chapters ago, back in chapter 15, God made his covenant with Abram. Abram and however many years have been in this interlude here, has gone into Hagar. He's had Ishmael, his son. Ishmael now is 12, 13 years old. And God has, as far as we know from Scripture, kind of been silent during this time with Abram. Abram sinned. All this stuff happened. The only one that we see God speaking to through an angel is to Hagar. And now God comes and appears to Abram and he says, walk before me and be blameless. And what's he kind of saying? Live a holy life. Stop, maybe, you know, kind of stop doing things your own way. Kind of a slap upside the head of, hey, you need to be following me, not doing things your way. And be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. So God, if you will, is reestablishing the covenant with Abram. And he, he, he's going to have Abram make a sign of his covenant. It's, it's actually a very painful thing that Abram would have to undergo in order to um, mark his obedience to the Lord. And, and an initial memorial of living holy unto God. Verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Now this is interesting. The word Abram means exalted father, but the word Abraham means a father of a multitude. And God gave him this new name, Abraham, Verse four, uh, excuse me, verse five. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. This is because the Arabic peoples would come through Ishmael, but also the Jewish people would come through Isaac, who is yet to be born. So there were a multitude of nations, not just a multitude of people here. Verse six. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Verse 9, And God said to Abram, As for me, Excuse me, And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner, so that's a slave as well, who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, we're going to see God talk even more next time in some more details about this that happens, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead and say Abram does go ahead. He's 99 years old. He gets circumcised. He also circumcises his young teenage son, Ishmael. And this is a practice that is continued. Male circumcision is a practice continued um, in the Jewish people today, Orthodox Jewish circles, and also in Arabic and Muslim circles today as well. It is considered a sign of being God's people. Now, what we're going to see next time is that the, the true heir, the uh, true heir of God's promise is not Ishmael, but will be the son Isaac. God is going to reestablish that later on in, verse, in chapter 17. But nonetheless, God will uh, bless Ishmael. He will bless Ishmael and he will keep his um, descendants alive. He will multiply them greatly. But they were not the children of promise. They were children of the flesh. Children of doing things his own way in his own sin. Rather than obeying God and doing things God's way and receiving God's promise. So we see Abram getting this. And God specifically said in verse 13, So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. God's covenants are They are everlasting. And this kind of goes back to when we studied chapter 15. We talked about that some. And this is not a contract. A covenant is not a mere contract. Contract, both parties have things to fulfill. And if you don't fulfill your end of the bargain, the, the contract can be broken. It's not the same way with a covenant. A covenant, literally, both parties are blood-bound to keep this. It is like marriage till death do you part. This is a very serious thing. This is not, this is lifelong. And since God is everlasting, his covenant is everlasting. A marriage covenant ends, you know, till death do us part, when death ends. But since God never dies, his covenant is everlasting. God's covenant with Abram and with the Jewish people that would come is an everlasting covenant. God's covenant with the descendants of Ishmael is that they would continue. Now, Ishmael's descendants would not be, though, God's chosen people. And Ishmael's descendants would not serve the one true God either. They would get off into serving their other gods, and they would cling to some symbols and remnants of this interlude in this story here, but they were not faithfully serving God. The Jews, constantly, throughout their history, have served God, then walked away from God, then served God. And there's this constant back and forth and struggle. Right now, for the, for the most part, as a representative whole, the Jewish people have, are still rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, there's some exceptions on an individual personal basis, but as a whole, the Jewish people, the nation... The ethnicity of the Jewish people has still been rejecting Jesus Christ. They're not walking with the Lord, yet God's covenant is sure. He protects the Jewish people. He preserves them. He continues to keep them alive and surviving when the entire world seems to hate the Jewish people and try to kill them, try to wipe them off the face of the planet. There's so many nations who try to do that today, and God continues throughout history to preserve them. Because he has promised to do so. He has a covenant with them. Jesus Christ will one day return and sit on a literal throne in a literal Jerusalem. And rule the world for a thousand years. God's covenants are sure. 
But the sign of the covenant, the circumcision of the flesh, is very painful. It is a painful mark. It's very painful for Abraham. He's 99 years old. It's very painful for his teenage son, Ishmael, for any of the uh, men in his house. Now, God's plan is for this covenant to take place when the males are eight days old. This makes another interesting part. This covenant is about their ethnicity and about their family, about what um, what nation they are a part of. This is not something the men freely choose to do. They don't get to, to just choose to be circumcised when they get older. This is something that they are mandated to do from the time they're, the males are eight days old. Very interesting that this is where this originated. Now, on a side note, there are health benefits to circumcision and things. It, it can decrease transmural of certain diseases and such. And perhaps that was part of God's method uh, for doing this. But regardless... This sign of their circumcision was one that was very clear. It would be very clear whether one was circumcised or not. And it was also a very painful thing. This was something that involved pain. It was a very painful thing on Abram's part. The scripture does not tell us why it was circumcision. But we know that the scripture does talk later on. In the prophets, it talks a lot about the circumcision of the heart. You know, circumcising the body is one thing. Circumcising the heart, that is a huge deal. Having a pure heart, cutting away the fatty, sinful, nasty buildup of this world from our hearts and having a circumcised, clean, devoted heart, pure unto the Lord, is so important. And God will talk about that so often throughout the prophets and say it's not really about the circumcision of the body. It's just a symbol of how God wants us to be wholly dedicated to him. These men are being circumcised physically. It's the sign in their flesh of the covenant. But God really does not. He, it's a symbol. He's not so concerned. I mean, yes, he, he has mandated them to obey that physical circumcision. But it's really meant to be a symbol of being a people to pursue God with their whole hearts and circumcise their hearts in repentance toward Him. It's not just about having an operation and then living however you want. No. No, this is a sign of a covenant to being God's people. And in our lives, sometimes we opt for, well, we want to undergo some type of quote-unquote circumcision. We, Yeah, it's something painful, it's something physical, but you know, it gets over with, it kind of marks us as being God's people, God's child but you know we don't really want to necessarily circumcise our hearts our affections our desires what we're devoted to our idols we'd rather go through if you will some painful experience yes we're identified as god's child but we don't really want to give things up we see this in our life But the important truth that I think we can gain from this whole interlude, this whole description here, is that God is relentless in his pursuit of Abram. There's years of gap here when we don't know what's going on. Nothing major seems to happen in Abram's life. Just continuing to live. Years go by. But God is relentless in his pursuit of Abram, the person, the individual he cares about. Abram's relationship with him. He loves Abram personally. Our God is a personal God. He is not just a judge who sits in heaven and orchestrates his will and is just, you know, ruling with an iron fist. No. Now, is our God all powerful? Yes. Is he truly God and has all power? Yes. We should tremble before him. There should be a proper fear there. He is God and we are not. But our God's character is so loving, so gracious, so merciful, so kind. May we not just bear, quote-unquote, a sign of the covenant in our flesh. 
May we circumcise our hearts unto the Lord.